Um, hi everyone, let's get started. Um, yeah, I think everyone pretty much already knows this, but the homework too is due next Tuesday. And yeah, if you have any questions, you can feel free to post on the discussion board. And some folks came to the office hours, which is great. Yeah, let's move on. So I want to finish by just going through some things that were unclear from last lecture. And I also have some more stuff that I wanted to finish that I didn't get to. So the first thing that I wanted to go back to is we we're talking about competitiveness um, and how you should uh, spin versus wait for a lock or how you should block. So I read the paper and basically they proposed this problem that you can either spin and the cost of spinning is proportional to the length of the time that you spin, or you can either block, which has context switch cost C, which is like in their paper, the cost to switch out and back. So there's some confusion about like, is this 2C, is this 4C? Cause like if C was out or back, then it would be two, but they just make C for one or this is one constant C. And you have this problem, the spin block problem is this question of how long should you spin before you block this deterministic algorithm that spins equal to C time and then blocks is too competitive, which means that you are at most a factor of two cost away from the optimal algorithm that would know exactly how long you have to wait. And the randomized algorithm that just picks some time uniformly at random between zero and C to spin for and then it blocks is 1.58 competitive. So hopefully that clears up that. Um, okay. And the second thing that I wanted to clear up from last time is we were talking about optimistic concurrency control. And there's this question of what happens if you're traversing this list and something gets deleted out from under you. Um, and one thing is that this is probably less likely in practice because you often are not deleting as much as you're querying or inserting your data structure. So um, in practice, it's not super common, but you still have to do it correctly. So last time we said you can use reference counting, uh, which is basically like you keep some counter of how many things, how many threads are on your elements at each time. And you can only garbage collect if that is zero, which means that nothing is currently on your element. There's this other thing called lazy synchronization, which is often combined with optimistic synchronization. Uh, that is like a more, uh, it's an approach that is more within the synchronization scheme. So the way that that works is, which is the pseudo code for it, this is pretty much the same as optimistic concurrency, and that you traverse forward without taking any locks up there. And then you try to get, um, yeah, and then you try to get the two locks that you need once you find your position, and then you do some validation. And it, this is for deletion. So if you find, okay, you grab the two things in between either, yeah, so current is the thing that you want to delete, and previous is the thing right before. And if you find it, or if you don't find it, then you just exit. If you do find it, you do two steps. The first one is called logical deletion, which is there's a bit in every element, and you mark that to true. And then the second step is physical deletion, so you set max to the SX. And then once you succeed in that, then you finish. So this is very similar to what we talked about last time, just regular optimistic, except now we have this extra step where you just set a bit. Okay, and this is the validation, pretty much also the same as before. Instead, now we also just check both bits before and after, and then we check that the next is still connected to what we think it is. Or we check that current is still connected to what we thought it was previously. Uh, and this is, you only have to do the validation once you grab the locks. You do not have to do the validation as you step through. And as we, as we kind of talked about last time, one issue with this, or not necessarily issue, but one thing that can happen is that you can traverse parts that have already been logically deleted. So like if you are traversing through here and someone out from under you logically deletes this or physically deletes this, you can be traversing a part that is not there anymore technically in the list. But the way that these things, I guess both optimistic and logical, or both optimistic and lazy concurrency, they work by this assumption, which is called freedom from interference, which means that you don't, nodes don't get garbage collected um, as long as they're still reachable in your list. So that solves the problem of like, if you're on the list or if you're on the element, what if it turns to garbage? Uh, if you're still reachable, then it will not turn to garbage by this assumption. 
And so you can still eventually get to some part of the list, even if it's just the very end. And then, uh, yeah, so you will never just like, this just guarantees that you don't crash when you're traversing through. Does that make sense? Great. So let's move on. Uh, last time at the very end, I was talking about doing concurrency control in B plus trees. Okay, so just to recap a little bit, this most straightforward scheme for doing concurrency control in B plus trees uses read or writer locks, which are you can take the locks in read mode, which is non-exclusive, or write mode, which is exclusive. And for find, you only need to take the read locks. For insert and delete, you take the writer locks all the way down. And you may have to hold more than just two locks at the same time. You may have to hold arbitrarily many as long as you don't know that nodes are safe, where safe means that you don't have to do a merge or a split. Okay, so we were going through these couples of examples and I just had two more that I wanted to finish. So here in this insert, we're inserting 45. We take the right lock up there, we go down and then uh, we see that B has space if anything underneath needs to split into it and promote, so we can release the lock on A. And then we keep traversing down. And then we need to keep holding D, because if it needs to split, then we would need to promote into B. So we're still holding B, D, and now the root, or now the leaf. And we can see that once we get to the leaf, we know that nothing up there is going to have to take a new element, so we can release those up there. And then we just put 45 into this leaf node. And that is finished. Uh, OK, so we want to insert 25 now. Same thing as before. There's still room in B, so we can release A then. Now we traverse a different part of the tree. C also has room, so we can release B. Now we have to split F, because 25 is going to go in here, but there's no space for it. So we have to keep. C and F because we're going to promote something into C. Okay, so now we, this used to be 23 and 31, but now we put 25 in here and we split this node, 31 becomes the new front and 31 gets promoted into C. Okay, so that is reader writer locks on B trees. One issue with it is that the first step for each of the insert and delete operations is that you have to take the right lock on the root, which is problematic because it's kind of similar to like when we had the linked list and we kept taking the lock on the head, that taking the right lock on the root becomes a bottleneck because it's an exclusive mode. So there's a variant of optimistic concurrency control in B-trees, which kind of has the same observation that most, like similar to linked lists, but this one is that most modifications in your B plus tree don't require split or merge. Actually, one in every B will, because like that's on average how often you fill up the node. And then the probability goes even less, like asymptotically less as you go up the tree, like up one after that is one over B squared and so on and so on. So similarly, we're going to optimistically traverse from top to bottom using read locks only. And then you take the right lock only on the leaf once you figure out what leaf you need. And if you guessed wrong, where guessing wrong means that you did need to promote higher up, then you just start again top to bottom using the same algorithm as before by taking right locks top down. Okay. Oh, yeah, this is exactly what I just said. So insert and delete, you take the read locks top down until the leaf, and then you take the right lock. And if you can just insert into the leaf and finish, that would be great. And if you cannot, then you start over. So this is how you do the optimistic concurrency control for B trees. Now you take the read lock on the root rather than the right lock. Oh, we're trying to add 50. Okay, and you just keep taking the read locks all the way down. And only when you get here do you take the right lock. And here, in this case, there was space in the last node to add 50, so we can just add it. And there's no split, so we just finished. But uh, if we added, if we need to add 25, like we did in the previous example, now we need to split F. So we took the right lock on F, but we can't do the promotion because we don't have any locks higher up. So we just have to start again. 
So to wrap up concurrency control, locking protocols are hard and they can require you to think carefully about whether they're correct or not. Um, you can avoid deadlock by respecting some total ordering of locks. So in B-trees, it's top down, left, right. In other things, it might be something else, but as long as you can kind of uh, number them in some way, then you should be fine. And uh, oftentimes, if you do something straightforward, it's easy to think about the correctness, but it's may need to be changed for high concurrency situations. And then there's forms of optimistic concurrency control that improve the situation when you have a lot of contention. Okay, I'm done with locking. Questions? Is that good? Uh, I have a question. So suppose uh, the trial node has a pointer points back to parent node. Do we need to traverse again and start node? Or can we just? You need to traverse again because uh, you need total ordering on your locks oh. to avoid deadlock. So you cannot go like back up because somebody may be coming down. Does that make sense? Good question. There is like, there are some forms of reader writer locks that you can promote like you have a read lock and then you can upgrade your read lock to a write lock. But those are also, there's also sometimes running into issues about deadlock. Like you have to implement them really carefully. Yeah. Question. Okay. So yeah, the main thing that I wanted to talk about today is how to analyze multi-threaded algorithms. So we did OpenMP programming a couple of weeks last week. And, but we just did programming. So I want to talk about like how you can prove bounds about those. Okay, so we want to quantify what is parallelism in a big O sense. And we're going to go back to this example of fib that we talked about last time. And concretely, I want to talk about, concretely, we'll just say like fib of four for illustration purposes. Okay, and this is how you conceptualize uh, parallel programs. So. This is FIB of four up here. And then each of these nodes is like a function call. So FIB of four here calls into FIB of three. And each of these like boxes around the thing is a parallel section that can operate independently. So FIB of four calls into FIB of three, FIB of three calls into two and one and so on. And then the leaves are just the leaves of the recursion tree. Uh, and this is called a computation DAG, which is just like the the function calls of your program and it occurs dynamically as you go through your parallel spawns and sinks or parallel four. And this idea of a computation DAG is processor oblivious. Like notice there's no assignment of the nodes to processors. So this is a way of just thinking about the functions that are going through your program and how long each of them is. Okay. So more concretely about the computation DAG, you can think of a parallel instruction stream as this DAG of vertices and edges, and each of the vertices is a strand, which is some instructions that don't require spawning or syncing or returning from spawn. So this is kind of like, yeah, so they're basically each of them is like a set of instructions or some function, and they may, yeah. And each edge is some spawn or a function call or a return. So there is like a spawn, and then this one is a return. And you can, yeah, so in the fib example, we did it just through recursive calls, through function calls, but you can also express something like this through loops because from an, for an analysis purpose, you can think of implementing loops using divide and conquer. So like if you had n iterations, you can think of splitting the n into like n over two chunks and then spawning those off, n over four and so on. So the span or the height of that recursion is log n. So one thing that we want to quantify is assuming that each strand is order one, what is the parallelism of this computation? Or parallelism in some sense is like how, what is the capability of your program to scale? Okay. So previously we had Amdahl's law, which found the strong scaling or how much speed up you can get given more cores or parallel resources. And Amdahl's law tells us that the speed up in terms of P, which is the number of processors, is bounded by one over the serial fraction, which is the fraction of your program that is not parallel. Okay, so using Amdahl's law, let's say this is our computation DAG, and we count the serial fraction. So like these yellow things are the serial fraction. And we say that the, ser so we can 
In this example, we can count the serial fraction. There's 18 total nodes. The serial fraction is three over 18, which is one over six. So the speed up is upper bounded by six. There are two main performance measures when we talk about parallel algorithms. The first one is called work, which is usually, oh yeah, there's PP, which is the execution time on P processors, but that's kind of like a, an empirical thing. In terms of theoretical things, there's T sub one, which is work. And in this example, it happens to be 18 because there's 18 nodes in this DAG. And yeah, so work is usually like in serial algorithms, work is like the big O running time in the RAM model, pretty much. It's like the number of instructions or computational steps that you have to do. So the new one is called span, which is usually uh, denoted by T sub infinity. And one way to think about span is the runtime that it would take if you had infinitely many processors. And span, if you if you had the computation DAG, span would be the longest path to your computation DAG mm -hmm. in terms of instructions. And span sometimes is also called critical path length or computational depth, because it's like, uh, in some sense, yeah. So it bounds how long you, the minimum time that you would need to take to go through this computation. And there are a couple of very simple things that we can get from these. So the work law says that in this very simple performance model, the maximum speed up you can get is P. And we talked about before, like in practice, that's not always true. You can get super linear speed up, but in terms of, a, in, the, in the theoretical sense, the best you can get is P speed up. And then the span law also says that the minimum time that we take on P processors is at least P sub infinity, which is the time that we would take on infinitely many processors. And yeah, so you can, basically those are the things that you want to prove bounds about. So if you have two sections in your program, A and B, if you, yeah, if they're in series, the work sums them up and the span also sums them up because you have to do them sequentially. If you can do them in parallel, you still have to sum up the work, but the span is now the max of A and B. So the speed up T sub one over T sub P is the speed up on P processors. There's several options. You can have sublinear, perfect linear, and then super linear, which is not going to happen in this theory model, but can happen in practice. Um, yeah, when we analyze parallel algorithms, we usually don't talk about P in the sense that P is not a parameter in the big O runtime. And usually that means that we assume that there's some unbounded number of processors or like you have more processors than you could possibly use in a practical sense. And obviously we don't have infinitely many processors in real life, we have some bounded number, but it's not a problem in a theoretical sense because we can simulate running on any arbitrary n processors using some p less than n processors by basically just doing the work in chunks. And that is Brent's law, which tells us that the parallel time on p processors is bounded below by p1 over p and bounded above by p1 over p and the spin. <clears throat> And yeah, so we just talked about work and spin, and parallelism is just the work divided by the spin. So in this case, the work is 18, the span is nine, and the parallelism is two. So going back to the fib example, and assuming, so we're going back to fib four, and assume that each strand in fib four takes some order one time. This is the computation DAG. The work is 17, the span is eight, so the parallelism is slightly above two. And the parallelism is kind of like a bound on how much speed up you could get with P processors. Like if you have more processors than parallelism, you won't get P speed up. So this is telling us that it doesn't really help us to have much more than two processors for FIB of four. So we can do a slightly more complicated example. So this is quick sort. And this is how you do quick sort in parallel, ignoring the fact that doing a parallel partition is more complicated, but you can see that you can spawn off the two sides of the quick sort in parallel. And you just have to do the partition up front, and the two sides can be done independently. So that's 
OMPS right here, and then you have to wait until they finish, and that's the end of your quick sort. So we know that quick sort has expected work n log n, and here the expected span is order n because the partition is linear, and right now we haven't parallelized the partition. So the parallelism is work over span. I guess this is the expected parallelism, which is now log n. This is a table. I'm not going to go through it, but like you can keep this for reference, which is the work and span of a lot of common problems like merge sort, matrix multiply, and so on. Okay. So does that make sense? Before we move on, is there, I don't fully understand the intuition of why the time is like the time on one processor over like the T of T on internet processes, like the previous slide, for like parallelism. Yeah, there's an inequality that we had. Um, this one. Uh -huh. So the bottom, like this side makes sense, but yeah. in this performance model, the best you can do is T1 over P. Yes, because like the amount of time to do it serially over P is the amount of processors you have. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's makes sense. Yeah, so the bottom part is just, if you had perfect scaling with your processors, P1 over P is how much time it would take. And the right side is just the minimum time that it would take. Um, it's actually just like big O of how much time it would take. Like if you're doing, yeah, so like if you put a big O in here, then P of P would be equal to max of parallel, best case parallel speed up and spin. That makes sense. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm really confused on like why, like how you can add the T1 over T there with like because. It's not a it's not a strict upper bound, I guess. Like this might better it might be better to say like less than. No, no, yeah, I, either way, like I don't like how is it bounded above by that? So you want, like I understand like if it was just t um uh, t span or like, like you're saying just, if it was just this one? Or wait. No, just that one, then that would be a smarter thing. So then never mind, I guess. Oh. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I don't how to say it. Yeah, I would say like this is not exact. This is you can think of this more as like a big O thing. Okay. We just take the uh the max of these two. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, let's move on. So one major form that these parallel algorithms take is divide and conquer recurrences. And the classical method for solving divide and conquer recurrences is called the master theorem, which our master method, and it takes recurrences of this form P of N equals A times T of N over B plus F of N, where F of N is some arbitrary function and A and B are usually constants. Yeah. A is greater than A is at least one, B is more than one, and F is asymptotically positive. And then there's some base case P of N is theta of one. Okay. So this is how, if you have a recurrence of that form, your recursion tree starts at P of N, and then you have fan out A, and at the top of the recurrence, you have to do F of N, some function of work. And then you have B sub problems, or sorry, you have A sub problems, each of size n over B. And so on. Now you have A sub problems again of now size T of n over B squared, and then all the way down until T of one. Okay, so the height of this recursion is log base B of n. And each level has this amount of work in some sense. You have, at the top, you had to do F of N. Here you had to do their A subproblems of F of N over B. Here there are A squared subproblems, F of N over B squared, and all the way down. And here, um, the total number of leaves you have is A times A to the power log N over, log base B of N. And T1 is the work of each leaf, which is just theta of N log B and log base b over a because you swap the exponent. So there are a bunch of cases in the master method 
The first one is if the number of leaves that you have, theta log n log base b over a, is much bigger than f of n. So that means the number of leaves is asymptotically huger than f of n, which means that the work is geometrically increasing as you go down the recursion. And this is some formulation of it, that f of n is asymptotically small compared to the, uh, the number of leaves. So here, the work of the recursion or the solution to the, the recurrence is just n log b, n to the power log b of a, because this thing is way huger than the thing on top. The second uh, case is, and the number of leaves that you have is similar to f of n. So the amount of work is arithmetically increasing as you go down, but it's not overwhelmed by the number of leaves you have. So um, the number of leaves you have, or sorry, the work of your function up there is the number of leaves you have times some polylog factor. And then the solution to that is the number of leaves you have times the polylog factor plus one in the exponent, because you have like log levels basically. And finally, the last one is if you're geometrically decreasing. So this is the number of leaves is much less than the work of the function at the top. And that's some formulation. F of n, which is the function, is omega of the number of leaves plus e in the exponent, where e is some constant. And the solution to that is just t of n equals theta f of n, where f of n is the work of the, like the side function because it's overwhelmed by the top. And some other regularity condition that is usually doesn't come up. So this is just a summary of those three cases. There's three main cases. One is you have way more leaves than work at the top. One is you have similar number of leaves within polylog factors as the one on top. And then the last one is the thing on top is way bigger than the number of leaves. So this is just a couple of examples about how you'd use this. So this recurrence T of n, A equals to four, B equals to two, this is the top one, F of n equals to n. Okay, so we're gonna compare n to the log base B of A with F of n, or yeah. So n to the log base B of A, n to the log base B of A is n squared and F of n is n. So n squared is way bigger than n, so that's case one, the bottom is much bigger than the top. And so the total time for the solution is n squared. And yeah, the other one, the next one is similar, but instead of f of n equals n, we have f of n equals n squared. So now they're equal within polylog factors. Uh, log to the exponent zero is technically a polylog factor. So then you just add one to the, to the exponent, and that would be log of n. So this n squared times log n. And the last case would be if your f of n is much bigger. So here f of n is n cubed, and n squared is much less than n cubed, so the total work is dominated by the top, so that's n cubed. And you might have some weird uh, functions, like here the recurrence part, a and b are still the same, but f of n is now different. Now it's n squared over log n, and uh, the master theorem doesn't apply to this case. And you can solve it by substitution or other methods. You can solve it by there's something called the Akrabazi method, which is much more complicated. But for a lot of recurrences, master theorem is totally fine. Yes. Sorry, again. Not right again. Why would the runtime be like larger? If like it's decreasing, if that makes sense, because it's like geometrically decreasing in the third case, right? Yeah, it's decreasing, but the you have to do this n cube work at the top. That makes sense. Yeah. So everything under this case is basically just saying that everything underneath is small compared to the top thing that you have to do. Great. So yeah, so we can talk about parallel loops for a little bit. There are kind of competing theoretical claims about parallel loops. So assuming that you have this parallel loops, you have n iterations and each one takes order one work. There's two ways that you can talk about the span in different parallel models. In the most oldest 
model is called PRAM or parallel random access machine, which is a straightforward extension of the random access machine model, like the usual one that you use in algorithm classes. And the span for that is order one for the entire thing, no matter how many iterations you have. But usually PRAM assumes that you have like infinitely many processors. So it would be order one if they're all independent. There's another one more recently called the SILK model, which has the span of log n, which is now not independent of the number of iterations you have. And it's log n because they implement loops with dividing functor. So the height of the like the recursion tree in that sense is log n. These two models, they're slightly different, but if like the work bounds are the same. And if you're trying to bring span bounds, the span bounds in the SILK model are, are at most a polylog factor off because you know, it will be log n OA in terms of parallel loops. And it doesn't affect how you analyze like fork and um, like spawn, just loops. So yeah, usually it doesn't matter too much in terms of the analysis, but it's just care just to be careful like which model you're in. So we can do an example. Suppose that we want to do matrix transpose. And this is the serial code to do matrix transpose. You have i from 1 up to n, and then from j goes 0 up to i. And you just plot i and j with j and i. So you can easily parallelize this by putting a parallel 4 up on the top in the outer one. So yeah, what would be the work and span of this thing? We can start with the work. What is the work? Just ignore the parallel four for a second. What is the work of this algorithm? Good. Uh, and what about the span? Just one. In line You're just parallelizing the top one. Uh, I guess it would just be the n. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the span is n because the maximum length of this inner loop is n. So you're yeah, exactly. So you're taking the span of the outer one is one, and the span of the inner one is max of the length of those loops. Does that make sense? Great. Perfect. So here, in this case, yeah, the work is n squared, and the span is theta n, and technically it's n plus log n in the self model, but that's just theta n. And then the parallelism is n squared divided by n, which is n. So it's actually still fine because like n parallelism is pretty good with large n. You can do a little better. So if we put the parallel four on the inner one also, the work is unchanged and the span is now theta one in PRAM and theta log n in the SILK model. The parallelism is just dividing them. Yeah. So this is better uh, in a theoretical sense, but in practice, you may think about parallelizing the, you may think more carefully about parallelizing the inner loop depending on how big it is. But in a, in a theory sense, like you should always parallel as much as possible. I just, uh, like in a practice sense, you might not necessarily parallelize that because like the work unit is not big enough. Yeah, like the, like when I is small, like the iterations and the number of iterations is small. Yes. Yeah. So this is just a small exercise about parallel loops. So we have two competing ways to write the parallel loop. This inside is doing vector addition. And the top one, we have a parallel four on the outside going from zero up to n, and we're going up by 32 each time. And then the inner one is just going serially over those 32. So this is basically like we've cut the parallel work into chunks of 32, and we're doing the serial one up to 32. And here we have parallel four, and instead of cutting it up by 32, we cut it up by z n over p, where p is the number of processors. And then we just do the same thing, but instead of, yeah, so the inner loop is still serial. And the work of both of these, you can see is the same, it's just order n, because you do one operation per, per iteration. But the span in the top one is theta one, because 32 is a constant, so the parallelism is theta n. And here, the span is n over p, because the inner loop as n over p iterations. And so the parallelism is theta p, which is not ideal because you want your parallelism ideally to be much higher than p. Yeah, 
So just like I said, you want parallelism bigger than p, even though you can get at most p speed up. Like you're usually like the scheduler is not perfect, and you want to cut some slack in terms of your uh, in terms of your algorithm design. So three performance tips. The first one is to minimize the span to maximize your parallelism. Ideally, we want at least 10x more parallelism than number of processors for linear speed up. Second one, if you have a lot of parallelism, sometimes you can trade off your parallelism to reduce the work overhead. So like I was saying, like if you have a lot of parallelism, you may not want to do one iteration per work chunk. You can trade some of your parallelism to reduce the overhead because there's overhead to spawning off this parallel task, like the scheduler has to deal with it and some core or thread has to take it and work on it. So um, yeah, and the last one is use divide and conquer or parallel loops rather than spawning one thing or another. So you can use parallel four rather than serial four and then spawn inside and sync because the span of this is theta n. Okay. And some more. This is kind of similar to the other one that I was saying. Ensure that the no the work that you have divided by the number of spawns that you have is large enough. So this is more of like in terms of divide and conquer. But even when you do divide and conquer, you don't want to recurse all the way down to one. You usually want to cut it off a little bit higher. Uh, yeah. When you want when you do parallelism, usually try to do the outer loops instead of the inner loops if you have to choose. Sometimes you might even just want to do the outer loops even if you don't have to choose, depending on how small the inner loop is. And be careful about your scheduling overheads. So these two are basically the same, except that the loops have been flipped. So this is i 0 up to 2. This is j 0 up to n. Parallelizing over i equals to 2, or parallelizing over two iterations is better than parallelizing on the inner, inner one with two iterations. Does that make sense? I had a question on that. Uh, I don't understand uh, how that is different. How this is different. This one, this one, you have to serialize over J, and then parallelizing over. Yeah, this one you serialize over J, and then you have to parallelize like over each serial iteration of J. Isn't parallelizing over large number of iterations much better than doing it over the few iterations? But either way, but you shouldn't do it inside. Because, like, this is serializing, or sorry, this is this is parallelizing two iterations on the inside, whereas this is parallelizing two iterations on the outside. So here, like, you have two separate work chunks of size n, and here you have n serial work chunks of size two. Why well, it's scattering overhead? I think it's uh, thread create create overhead. Uh, they're related. Like when you create the thread, you have to eventually it has to get scheduled to get finished. There is also thread creation overhead. You have to like put it in a form that the scheduler can deal with it and give it to some resource. But why is there scheduling problems between these two approaches? Why are there scheduling? Well, you're making there's more there's more uh, scheduling chunks in the second one, right? In the second one, there's two n scheduling chunks, and in the first one, there's only two scheduling chunks. Yeah, exactly. Like here, yeah, here you have two n things because there's n things on the outside, and parallel four is two on each one. Oh, and then here there's two on the outside. So why is two why is n? This is spawning each one of the iterations separately. And parallel four is better to implement through like divide and conquer or through static cut up of the iterations. Oh. This one is spawning each single thing off as one job okay. or one task. But this is still a feasible. Uh, you can take an R parallel for You can write it, yeah. uh, but it's not recommended because oh. <laughs> the performance will be done. But it is, it will be correct. But it will be serialized. This was outer loop is serial. But uh, after sworn, the main thread can continue to spawn next thread, and there will still, still be parallel. Uh, yes, I guess so. Yeah. So you, so the issue is that 
yeah, so the iteration can happen in serial, but you have to wait until you get to the end to spawn, to work on like the last iteration, for example. You have to wait until you reach the end of this for loop to look at the work for i equals n. Whereas here, like, depending on how you cut this up, you can start anywhere in your iterations, as long as these are independent. Sorry. The second slide. Uh, could you remind me again why why can't we have the loop switch where like isn't the best loop going to be the other one if J is less than N and the inner is I is less than sorry if J is less than N but the other loop I is less than two and then you parallelize the outer one like the bottom one when you put parallel four to the outside and then four to the inside. Yes. Yeah. That would be better than both of these probably. I, it, this is more like a, if you could, if you were to choose between either one of these. So yeah, so we're gonna go back to matrix multiply. This is matrix multiply that we've been doing before. We have C equals A times B. And we can do this, we can express it with this summation. And for simplicity, we'll assume that they're powers of two. So we have this very easy three loop matrix multiply and we can parallelize it. We just put parallel four on both of the outer loops and the inner one, innermost one is serial. The work is still n cubed. The span is theta n in both PRM and the silk model and the parallelism is n squared. Okay. But like we talked about, uh, it's not, for caching reasons, it's not the best to write these three loops. So we can do this recursive one where we have where we cut the matrix into subproblems and then we do eight sub eight sub matrix additions and one sorry eight sub matrix multiplications and one matrix addition. So just to remember the way that the matrices are laid out is in something called row major, which is basically you lay the rows end to end, and the way you do the indexing into the matrix is uh, like for row i and column j, you have n times i plus j. For any submatrix, it's n sub m, where n sub m is the width of the submatrix. And to, to, to do divide and conquer, this is how you do the index calculation. But from like a theory point of view, you don't really need to know this. Okay, so this is the code for the parallel divide and conquer matrix multiply. Like I said, we have eight sub, oh, yeah, we have eight sub matrix multiplies. Restrict up there just means that the compiler can assume that the matrices are not alias. So that's like a C keyword that just says the matrices are not the same, so it can do some underlying optimization. And sub C, A, B is the row size. N is the input matrix size. So there's two cases. One is in the if, which is if your n is less than some threshold, which is your coarsening threshold, then you just do some base case, which is the three loops. Otherwise, you go into this else. So to do the else, first you have to allocate a temporary matrix of size equal to the original input matrix. Uh, this is just a macro to do the indexing. And these are the eight subproblems, and you can do them all recursively. And then after you do them recursively, you wait until they finish. And the reason that you need the temporary is because, so like you can notice, let me go back. Half of these add into C, half of these add into D. And the reason is because there's conflicts on the positions in the output. So then at the end, you add them together, you add C and D, and then you can free D. Yeah, and yeah, adding is just, you do this two loops over C and D, and then you add D into C. And then that's it, then you free D and then you finish. 
Um, you're doing uh, the uh, parallel response, and that's like the same, like semantically as like um, the OMP like task share mm -hmm. and like task weight at the end. Yes, okay. yep, exactly. I just did it because the number of lines would double. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and also like, uh, this is agnostic of the Intercity platform. Like okay. that would be an open MP, but like there are many other Intercity yeah. platforms and they all, they pretty much all have spawn as a construct, but like the syntax is a little different. So yeah, we can start with analyzing matrix addition. We have these two parallel for loops. The work is quadratic. The span is log n in the self model. Now we're going to do the work of matrix multiplication. The recurrence is we have eight subproblems. Each one is in size n over two. A sub one of n is the work that it takes to add the matrices, and we have theta one to cut up the subproblems. So the work is a m sub one n over two plus n squared, and we can apply the master method. All the work is in the leaves, and that's n cubed. So if we look at the spans, or we look at the span, now we take the max over all of the spawns, and the recurrence is now just one of these. It used to be eight, now it's one m sub infinity of n over two, plus the span to do the sum, the, the addition, plus theta one. And this is case two of the master theorem because f of n is log n, so the solution is log squared n. The, okay, so again, the parallelism is the work over the span, which is n cubed over log squared. So for a thousand by a thousand matrices, the parallelism is pretty high. It's about 10 to the seven. And a thousand by a thousand matrices is not even that huge. So that you can see the parallelism is very high. So one idea that we can implement is we have this temporary D, but in practice, usually we want to minimize the, ex the external storage we have to use. Um, even though in a, an asymptotic sense, the N squared was much less than the total work, we still have to do this allocation every recursive call and the addition. So we are adding these constant factor, not even constant factor overheads, but just asymptotically smaller overheads. And we have a lot of parallelism. So maybe we can trade some of this parallelism for less space. So the way that we would write that is previously we had eight and then a sink. Now we have four to do the four subproblems. We sink. We have another four to do another four subproblems, and then we sink again. Now we only need to add in the C. So we can reuse C without having a race, and then we've gotten rid of this overhead. The work is still the same, but now f of n becomes theta one instead of theta n squared, but still the work is all in the leaps, so it's still n cubed. And the span is now we add these two portions, so that's two n over two and theta one, and this is the master theorem again, f of n is much smaller than n, and so the span is n. So the work is the same, the span is now linear in n, and the parallelism is n squared, which is worse than it was before, but still pretty high, like for a uh, thousand by thousand, now it's 10 to the six. And in practice, this is faster because you don't have to keep doing allocation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the last example that I want to talk about is parallel merge sort. So the main difficulty in doing parallel merge sort is doing a parallel merge. This is the, the, the normal way that you do a serial merge. So you have two, you have an output array C and you want to merge two sorted arrays A and B into it. So the way you would do that is you have A and B, which are the links of A and B. And you just do this like two finger iteration through A and B and you check while you still have either of them left, if A is less than, if A is a, at most, put it at the head of B, then you add A to C. Otherwise, you put B, and then you keep going around until you run out of one of them. And 
if you still have either of them left, then you just put them at the end of your output array. The work of this is theta n because you do theta one work per thing. Assuming that I guess n is the length of a and b, then the work is proportional to the length of a plus b. Okay. So merge sort uses the merge of the subroutine. We can easily see merge sort, you have your temporary b, you have your input a, and then n is the length, and you can spawn these subproblems. Yeah, c is your temporary. And then, yeah, so you spawn both halves, and you assume that both halves have been sorted by the time you come up out of the sink, and then you merge them. The work of this is you have two subproblems. Each one has size n over two, and the merge has work n. So the work total is n log n. So oh, yeah, you can solve that using the master theorem. Okay. And if you want to analyze the span, the you just take the max. So that's just n over two. There's no more two in front. And the span. Uh, this f of n is theta n because right now the merge is serialized. And so using case three of the master theorem, f of n equals to theta n, which is much bigger than the number of leaves. So uh, the span is theta n. Yeah, so that's the work in the span. And again, the work divided by the span is the parallelism, which here is log n, which is not great because log n is very small. So we need to parallelize this. And the way we're going to parallelize it is, again, doing some kind of recursive thing. So suppose we have two arrays A and B. Basically, the way this works is that you pick Without loss of generality, you pick A to be the bigger one. You pick the midpoint. Uh -oh, a and B are sorted. You pick the midpoint in A. You search for its position in B. And then you recurse. And at the leaves, you merge them together. So that's how you get two parallel halves, because you're guaranteed that uh, like the range of elements is determined by the pivot that you chose in A. Does that make sense? Yeah. And it's important that. You choose the halfway point because this guarantees you that each subproblem is within a constant factor, is at most three quarters n, which is a constant factor less than the subproblem right above it. And you can see that, like, this one is one half. And since b is less, then uh, the size of the problem is bounded by this. So, this is the code to do the parallel merge. If if NA is less than NB, so NA is the smaller one, then you just flip them and you recurse again. If you're at the end, if NA is equal to zero, then you return. And then otherwise, the more interesting case, like I said, you choose the midpoint as your pivot. You do some binary search into B to look for the element that was the midpoint. And then you set. Uh, yeah, you set the midpoint into C, which is your output that you're merging into, and then you spawn the two subproblems. And when you spawn them, you sync. And in reality, you'd probably want to set NA equal to B, something bigger. But this is easier to write the pseudocode for. Okay, so how would we analyze this? First, we want to talk about the spin, because the whole point was trying to decrease the spin. So like I said, the subproblems are up to 3n over 4 as large as the original problem. The span of this intermediate thing is the binary search, which is the log n. That's f of n. And using the master theorem, uh, we get log squared. Okay. The work is now way uglier. This is supposed to say work, but. Uh, so we have two subproblems here, just alpha is the constant factor that is bigger, or that is 
smaller than. So one of the subproblems is alpha n. One of the, the other one is one minus alpha n. Then this intermediate thing is log n because you have to do the binary search. And alpha is bounded between one quarter and three quarters. And this is not in the master theorem, like the subproblems are now different sizes, but I claim that this thing is still linear. And we will prove it with substitution. So uh, you have this recurrence at the top, p sub one, alpha n, one minus alpha n, and log n. And our inductive hypothesis is that this solution is bounded above. Uh, the work of k is bounded above by some constant times k minus some constant times log k, or minus some constant times log k, where the constants are greater than zero. And then we want to prove that this holds. And the way we're going to do this is we use the inductive hypothesis by substituting into the assumption. So uh, yeah, so p sub one, c one times a n, and then p two times log a n. Then, yeah, so these are the two halves, like a n and one minus a n, c one c two. The constants are the same, and eventually you will get here that it is in fact bounded above by theta n. So now we have made the spin log squared n, and the work is n, so the parallelism is much better than it would. Now it's just not serial anymore, it's n over log squared. And we want to plug that back into the parallel merge sort that we had before. So now we just put parallel merge where we had merge, and now the work is still the same as before as n log n using the same analysis. And the span is now, this used to be plus theta n, now it's plus theta log squared. And using case two of the master theorem, we get that the span is log cubed. Um, yeah, and that's the parallelism. Now it's much better than log n. It is n over log squared. That's all I had for today. Thanks.